Hi, I'm Diane Marie Collins, and you have entered the DM Zone. Today, my guest is artist Roger Cole. Welcome, Roger. Thank you. I should add that you are also a new member of the Western Artists of America. That is a very exciting <laughs> thing to happen. Uh, I'm so honored to be in uh, the, with that quality of a group. Mm. A museum level, I never dreamed that I would take the medium I'm in that far, and it just makes me want to do even better. Well, let's talk about your medium. It is an incredible, it, the medium is leather, and your work is called Pictorial Leather Sculpture? Yes. Yes. Uh, and you are going to be part of the sculpture group in the WAA. I will be judged against bronzes, stone sculptors. It's an amazing thing to have happen because the word craft hangs on leather. <laughs> to have it taken up to pictorial leather sculpture and be recognized at a gallery level, now at a museum level, mm -hmm. is a real mm -hmm. honor. And I'm so proud to be in the company of some of the great artists that I'll be working with. Well, it's exciting for them, I know, talking to their president, Mr. Holmes. Um, one of the things that I'd like you to explain a little bit to me is how you came to this um, um, art and how you developed your art. It's your technique. It's your, it's, it's Roger Cole. It is my pet, and uh, I, I'm very proud of the fact that it was something that I developed myself. It was actually a process of elimination. Okay. The hammered work, which is wonderful for craft projects, gives a hard edge to things. And I wanted a softer look that would be more of a fine art project. By eliminating tools and finally developing down to a clay modeler stone and a swivel knife. Two tools. Two tools. Oh my goodness. Uh, from literally hundreds. This is what gives me the look that I wanted for a fine art approach. Well, that's this wonderful curved, soft, multimedia because you then add what else to it? Well, there are dyes, colors. Mm -hmm. uh, I also uh, inlay turquoise, Sleeping Beauty turquoise. And it's a very much a Southwestern project. Although as an artist, I'm capable of any style, my interest is very deep in the Four Corners region of the Southwest. Which is where that turquoise is familiar a with. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the neat things, you've been doing this and your inspiration came early in life. Yes, it did. Uh, <laughs> I started working on leather when I was 10 years old, not knowing where it would ever go, but I had the interest. And it was strictly an art interest. It was not doing the comb case in camp or okay. <laughs> the belt for dad. My interest was art. I did my first leather picture when I was 10. Wow. And it's something that I've worked and dabbled with over the years, never dreaming that I would ever be able to be a full-time artist. Now it's 32 years full-time, and I love every second of it. How exciting. And so the difference is, is what we're looking at here with the craft of leather versus the art of leather. And that is the three-dimensional. It is sculpted. Yes, it is. It's interesting how you develop these things. You want something that appeals to the public. Mm -hmm. And when you work in the public's eye, uh, you don't want to be ignored. You want something that captures their interest and captures their imagination. And the tradition is so familiar that people are no longer fascinated by it. They see it all the time or they see uh, reproductions of it, uh, things of this nature. But going into the art, this is something they have not seen before. And when they look at it, they very rarely, at first, identify it as leather. Mm -hmm. They always think it's something else. Yeah, what, what, what is that? What, what is that? That's, that's the first right. thing that when you and look at it. And that's what you want. You want people <laughs> to pay attention to you as an artist. And it's been a gift as far as I'm concerned. It has really turned out to be something wonderful. What grand work to be involved in is the creative process. And then to get a reward for it by being able to work in it is really frosting on the cake. Now, one of the things about the WAA is they like to mentor. I'm not sure there's another artist out there that does your sculpting. No, but I think mentoring is done in a different ways. Mm -hmm. They may not know the root of my work, but the encouragement that you get by being at that level mm -hmm. with those people who are the most marvelous painters and sculptors that you can imagine so just the approval alone is a boost into what you do. So it's mentoring in a different way. Mm -hmm. And what it does is brings you up. It makes you want to go farther. It makes you want to please your associates. Uh, keep surprising them with the level that you can reach. And of course that just benefits everyone then. High quality museum level work with museum level artists. And you though are collected in museums already. Yes, uh, I'm in the Booth Museum in Cartersville, Georgia, 
marvelous, marvelous place. Wonderful, yeah. One of the best in the country. I'm in the Hemrick Johnson Museum in uh, Ohio. Mm -hmm. I'm in two local museums here. But the fact that uh, you get work to that level, and it's such an honor to have someone put your work in a permanent collection. And uh, it, it makes you want to do better and better and better. And really, uh, instead of looking at it as the end of a career, and this is what I've attained, you really look at it as a beginning. So many more things that you must do. <laughs> and, uh, and Another I'm, level, another step. Another level. And perhaps, do you see somewhere down the line where someone will come to you and say, you know, I love that. Is there such a way that you can teach me how to create this art? I have often thought about that, and I've been asked many, many times over the years, I don't know what kind of a teacher I would be in that so much, so much of the stuff that I do is uh, creative work is instinctive mm -hmm. and it's hard to explain instinct. Why did you do it that way? Well, I did it because I, at the moment I thought it, it would look great. <laughs> but I do think there is a, a, an introduction process to where you can show people the tools you use, the techniques you use, different things like that that encourage them. Whatever they do with it, they may come up with something totally different and unique, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. And anyone that is creative and is doing their own style and developing their own work, you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, every artist needs a model, as they say, mm -hmm. and you have to work into that. But if I were to advise new artists, I would certainly tell them to learn how to draw, learn the root of all art. If you do a lousy drawing and you paint it, and I don't care what colors you use, <laughs> it probably isn't gonna be a very good painting. Mm -hmm. But if you learn good foundation artwork, and then carry it on to any medium, it's bound to benefit you somewhere along the line. I was going to say, tell me a little bit about your um, art education. Where did it come from? Uh, that's, it's kind of lame. <laughs> uh, being self-taught, sometimes that sounds arrogant, that you're so clever you taught yourself everything. I'm a man that has ruined more leather than any living human. <laughs> but in the process of doing that, I've created thousands of pieces of work mm -hmm. uh, that people seem to appreciate and enjoy. And when you uh, start looking at this and how it develops and how it goes on, uh, you look at the education that you get, uh, a lot of it's trial and error. Mm -hmm. But you, as an artist, you can't say that you didn't educate yourself because you're always looking at things. It's like a painter who doesn't paint very often or they're away from that palette they're still painting in their minds. They're still running these ideas through their heads. And I think I'm a, a, a great deal that way. Where the ideas come. Yes. I see you paint um, portraits and also still lifes. And then you do a really fun, unique cars. Talk to me about that. <laughs> well, when you're teenage boys, everybody draws cars on their notebooks and teachers get driven crazy by the kids <laughs> sitting back there and they, they think you're doing your math when you're doing a 40 Ford. <laughs> the truth is uh, uh, men love cars, women love cars. Mm -hmm. And of course uh, it's the nostalgic part of car ownership. It's such a part of the history of this country. Absolutely. I don't like to do a car just so it's a car sitting there. I want it to do it as part of an art piece. Usually I stay to the Southwest genre. I will do uh, an old Model A sedan sitting in front of a Pueblo oh, what fun. or sitting in front of a cantina mm -hmm. or one of the old garages. I want it to have an art background. I don't want it just to be a car sitting there. I might uh, have a horse tied to the bumper. Never tie one to your door handle. <laughs> but it becomes an art piece along with the car. And I am a stickler for detail on that. I, I want it to look like what I want it to look, at, mm -hmm. look like. Mm -hmm. I want people to recognize it immediately is a real solid rendition of the car that they fell in love with when they were kids, the first car that they had, the car that they always wanted to own, whatever it is. Right. But that's just something that's an extension of being capable of doing all types of art. Yes, and so it is. It's a true drawing. It's realism. But again, that wonderful medium, leather, three-dimensional, sculpted, pictorial, a picture. It says everything. <laughs> I love what I get to do. And uh, I hope it goes on forever. Well, uh, the passion shows through. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> I appreciate you taking time to visit with me today. I appreciate you inviting me. It's been such a, such a joy to visit with you. All right. And you have been in the DM Zone. Come back soon. <laughs>